nervous. My stomach's going to chill. Yeah. Yeah. This is Louise Mason. Today she's getting married. 25 years ago, almost to the day, Louise was born without arms and legs, a victim of a drug called thalidomide. It had been prescribed to her mother as a sedative during pregnancy. The makers said it was safe. Mm -hmm. Louise normally uses a wheelchair, but today, because she's always dreamed of walking up the aisle, she's wearing artificial legs. Let's have a look. No, it's not right, it's gaping. No, it's gaping because you're looking down. Yeah, I know, but it's, it's You tiny. want it tighter like that? Oh, yeah, without <laughs> you pulling me over. I've always said to myself that if I was marrying somebody in a wheelchair, I would stay in a wheelchair. But if I was marrying somebody six foot six, the one advantage of having artificial legs is you can be six foot six. You haven't got to be any particular height. When I met John, I touched what I said, and I will be at a decent height, which happens to be five foot two. <laughs> that it is suitable and I decided that it would look much better, eh, in a wedding dress, walking up the aisle and sitting in the chairs. It's just something that I made my mind up years ago. I think just, 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 how's it looking? Yeah, it's just like that. In Britain, there are more than 400 victims of thalidomide. When they were born, Many doctors thought that the most severely deformed would never survive into later life. But survive they did, to become a remarkable generation. Tonight, we meet three members of that generation. This is their story. They thought I was going to die. Um, as you can see, I didn't. And when my dad heard that I was born, he bought a bouquet of flowers a pink ribbon and a blue ribbon. He saw me make it, but he threw the flowers all over the wall. Good boy. From the age, I think it was about seven years old, I knew I'd get married. I didn't know when, obviously, but I knew that I, I would get married. Uh, I had to, I was lucky enough to find somebody like John. We complement each other, really. John um, has, has got bad eyesight. So I do all the driving and all the visual things that need doing. And um, everything that I can't do, and he's here, he'll, he'll help me do it. I've taken on exactly the same as what any other young man would take on when he marries a lady or a woman. The difference being with me that um, it's more involved. You know, there's certain things that I have to do for Louise that perhaps another man wouldn't do for his wife. Love. That's basically it. I mean, we, we love each other. We enjoy each other's company. Um, and we've got the same interests as, you know, the two of us. So, I mean, it's love is the most important thing. I feel envious of some um, couples now. Now, when jo now John and I are courting or we're going to get married, when we walk down the streets, I feel for John, but I also feel for me that we can't walk arm in arm. He's stuck behind me, pushing the wheelchair, and I'm sat there like Lady Muck, letting him push it. It's not as romantic as it, as it would be walking down the street. So, yes, I was, I was then, not was then people, I feel betrayed that I couldn't have had that Oh, God. Yeah. What's he like? Um, 
We'll be happy, I'm sure, especially now that I I've got John. I couldn't have asked for a better man. I, Louise, take you, John. I, Louise, take you, John. To be my husband. To be my husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. Thank That's wonderful. Right, Kev, come on, here we go. I'd like to hurry a bit this morning because we're a wee bit late. Okay? We're always late for school. I know we're always late, but that's your fault. As the thalidomide children grew up, it seemed they would always be dependent on others. World in Action filmed Kevin Donnellan 15 years ago at the age of 10. I'm not put too much toothpaste down, I'm just putting a wee little bit on there. Yeah? I'll get scrub in the back as well, okay? That's a good boy. No one ever dreamed that Kevin could lead an independent life. But today, at 25, Kevin lives in a flat on his own, drives his own car, and has a job advising people who have problems. I was 22 at the time and I felt it was about the right age to leave home because I thought if I don't leave home now, I never will. I mean, my parents had looked after me all those years and I felt that, well, obviously, they're not going to look after me forever as they get older. And I didn't want to rely on family or friends. I mean, I'm sure my family would have taken over the role of looking after me, but I didn't want to rely on anyone. And I felt I just needed to be independent. I thought the first night I left home, I thought I'd carry my eyes out or whatever. But it wasn't, it was just a sense of immense excitement that for the first time in my life, I was my own boss, if you like. You know, all the decisions were up to me and I had my own freedom. to do everything from scratch, like a young child. Simple things like their basic cooking. Every simple thing is like a challenge, if you like. I mean, making a cup of tea, you know, I like poured bottled water, you know, all over the place, you know, and spilled things and, you know, I ruined loads of meals that I cooked. I mean, it wasn't, you know, 
It was trial and error, really. But I just carries on, you know, just persevered with it. Well, the best thing about this car is that uh, from the outside it looks like an ordinary car. So I've been thrilled since I've got it, you know. It's completely changed my life, really, because it's given me total independence. I've been pulled up for speeding, um, and the first thing they say is, Can you step out of the car, please? And I say, Well, I can't actually, officer. And then they look in the car, and then they sort of look embarrassed. And then they sort of like, you know, they're amazed about the car, and then they ask me all sorts of questions about how it's adapted and things like that. My job title is Information Officer, which basically consists of giving advice on welfare benefits. Come in. Some Hello. people are shocked when they first come into the office and see the wheelchair. Well, they might come in and say, oh, I'm looking for Mr. Donnellan. And I, I, I say, well, I'm Mr. Donnellan. Come in, what can I do for you? And then they're quite surprised. I'm taking to a laundry allowance, but I don't really know if I am. If it wasn't for this job, the compensation money would have been spent two years ago. Don't scratch your duck brush. I'm not scratching my duck. Well, it does scratch, doesn't it? Well, I'll buy During them. Kevin's childhood, long legal battles against the distillers company, who made thalidomide in Britain, eventually won compensation. Victims received individual payments and a charitable trust was set up. But the individual amounts now seem inadequate for a lifetime especially for people who want to be independent. Well, when I was about 11 with the court cases we were going through, I was awarded um, £22,000. When it came out of the courts when I was 19, it had gone down to just over £19,000. Uh, the courts badly invested it. It's just peanuts, really, given the fact that, you know, I've got no arms and legs. I mean, it's just an insult, really. I mean, on the face of it, £22,000 is a lot of money, but, I mean, not when you consider that, you know, 30 years hence. I mean, I'm going to need that money for the rest of your life. Um, and things like electric wheelchairs are expensive and all the other aids and adaptions which I need to rely on to have an independent life. I mean, it all costs money. It is a scandal. Um, there was no sort of justice involved. Um, you know, the company who developed the drug is a multi-million pound, multinational company. Uh, earns millions of pounds a year in profit. Um, I mean, I need to talk about compensation of £22,000, which is just a pittance, really.
when I first left home, I sort of like did everything that I was protected against when I was living at the family. So I was sort of like threw myself into politics, like revolutionary parties, the Socialist Workers Party, went on all sorts of demos. I'm still active politically. Um, at the moment, I'm in the Green Party because I think environmental issues are important. And I'm in anti apartheid and CND. I think it's important to protest at, at every possible opportunity about these uh, vile weapons. If, if you believe in something that's strongly enough, you should get out and demonstrate and get off your arse. I mean, just because you're disabled shouldn't stop you. We stop cutting that fence. Then I will have to arrest you for criminal damage to the fence. I do not have to say anything unless you want well to. Well done, Kate! People have got prejudices about disabled people like that, about other minority groups in society. Do you think that because I'm disabled that I won't sort of have any ordinary, you know, I might be uh, physically disabled, but do I think I'm, like, disabled emotionally as well? Do you think I haven't got the same emotions as anyone else? How did you first pluck up courage to ask girls out? Well, I've always been a daring person anyway. Um, I haven't let the fact that I'm disabled stop me in anything, really. Um, and I just saw this well, one girlfriend who was really serious with me. Um, I met her in one of the offices in work, and I thought, you know, she's quite attractive. Um, and I'd, I'd known her to speak to on the telephone as well, so I knew I liked her personality. That came across quite strongly. And I just sort of, like, took a deep breath and picked up the phone and said, what are you doing tonight? Do you fancy going out for a drink? And um, I really expected her to say no. And she said, yeah, I'd love to. And then, like, I nearly fell off the electric wheelchair when she said yes. And uh, I was thrilled a bit, so I took it out and took it for a meal, actually, you know. I went really over the top. And it, we started going out with each other, and it was a really good relationship. Um, you know, I think we loved each, each other. It was like a two-way thing. And the fact that we were just holding hands in public made all the difference. I mean, here's someone who appreciates me for, you know, as a person, who doesn't see someone without arms and legs, but she sees the whole me. I was consciously aware that this like, beautiful girl was by my side, and I thought, you know, look at this chap, look at my girlfriend. I was quite proud of her, if you like. I'm not going to go into detail, but we basically broke off. I think it naturally, I, I was just, like, so devastated and heartbroken, you know, I just couldn't handle it, really. I was just, like, really devastated. And I really just got over it now, really, but I was, I was really hurt by it, cos I had so many expectations about how I'd like the relationship to go. And we, we, we really did plan marriage and things like that. And she was thinking about moving into the flat with me, you know, in a couple of weeks' time before we finished, be, before we broke up. At the time that you felt worst mm. about it, what did you do? Well, I took an overdose, which I regret now. I mean, I didn't want to kill myself. I just wanted people to wake up to the fact that I had, had a problem. I mean, I felt people weren't taking me seriously enough. So I thought, you know, I'll make sure people <laughs> get to know. Um, I mean, friends, not necessarily family. I didn't want to sort of approach my family about it. But I just wanted people to, to be aware that, you know, here's someone who, who did have emotions. I mean, I'm an emotional being as well, like everyone else. Do you hope to marry one day? Yeah. I mean, why not? I mean, I live on my own, I've got a job. I mean, why the hell not? I've got a brain. Um, I mean, and now I can love someone. I mean, uh, you know, I can, I can give just as much love to, to a girl as, as I'd expect her to give to me. I mean, why not, really? Liam Evans is also a thalidomide victim. For him, the prospects of a normal life are poor. Liam is blind, unable to speak, and has no arms. His story is one of missed opportunity. Because he can't communicate, doctors believed he was mentally handicapped. Now they think a terrible mistake was made and that Liam was born with normal intelligence. For the first five years of his life, it was also assumed that Liam couldn't walk. But in fact, there's nothing wrong with his legs. Today, he lives in a health authority home. Denise Berry, a worker there, is his closest friend. All right. Why are you doing this for Liam? I'm finding a way of contact with Liam. It's 
that's a way of communicating with him, giving him a touch that he enjoys and relaxing him. All right, Liam. Okay, turn your foot over. That's right. What do you think he gets out of it? Well, he enjoys being touched. Um, he enjoys the sensation of the hands going on his feet. He enjoys the smell of the oils that we put on him. Makes my back ache, you know, this does. Yes, it does. It's all right for you, it's up there. Okay, just relax yourself down. All right, there you go. He understands everything you say to him. You get a response from him. He also tells you when he doesn't want to do anything. He makes it quite clear. He's always keen and eager to do whatever we want to with him and to join in all the activities that we have. Mm -hmm. oh. and here we are. Over to where the we do as much as we can with him to keep him walking, to keep his feet supple, to use his body as best he can. Balance is one of the greatest difficulties. If you notice with Liam, he, he doesn't walk one foot in front of the other. He tends to walk slightly with his feet splayed. Um, in order to give him balance. The other difficulty is that if, if you're blind, you do tend to use your hands to, to feel where you're going. Well, Liam can't do this. Yeah. Liam, would you like to take your shoes and socks off, please? Right. OK. Put your socks in your shoes. Neatly. <laughs> Good lad. Liam was born with almost no roof to his mouth. With the right operation early enough, he might have been able to speak. But now doctors think it's probably too late. Instead, they hope he can learn to communicate using an electronic voice. That's the no. Can you find me the yes switch? No. Reach out. Reach out. Reach out with your other foot. Yes. That's it. OK. Right. It's a tense moment as Liam makes a faltering start. Now. After 25 years of silence, he's about to use words for the first time. You go swimming, Liam. Yes. Oh, Liam Evans, you did not. You didn't go swimming. I'm going to say no. Where's that no? No. That's right. It was Clinton that went swimming, wasn't it? His main thing that we're working on at the moment is his communications, and I really feel that that is the field that he's got to go on, into and be improved on. It's the most important thing that Liam can do is to be able to make decisions for himself and make demands of people instead of always having his decisions made for him. Liam is a person, he can understand everything that's been said to him, and he can respond. Did Clinton go swimming? Yes. Ah, oh, that's right. Did I go swimming? I think he's happy. Did Sue go swimming? You... There are times when, I, when, like everyone else, when he's not as cheerful yes. as other times, but on the whole, I think Liam is a very happy person. That's right. Is that he why is. you haven't seen him? Is that why you haven't seen Richard? Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. yes. He's not been around. Is he going to be in tomorrow? Yes. No, he's off for two no. weeks. That's right, no. no. That's it. That was a positive one. Have you found that no at last? No. <laughs>